Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. So anyway, we'll get to this final comment on our society. I think I um, tried to point out, as we were going along, that not only is the society of AA different than it was in the 60s, which is as far back as I can go, and... um, and the 50s because of history and being able to have known people that got sober in the 50s. <clears throat> so the AA is uh, society is different and the society that we live in. And of course, they're going to affect each other. I think I talked about the fact that AA got started right in the mix with a lot of other things. A lot of new age, new thought came kicking into being. Unity Church being one example. And that science was becoming the new answer to questions about life as opposed to religions, which was the old way. This is what life is. Etc. And we can explain it through a uh, power called God. And as science moved on, their um, almost all the scientists I've studied, there's there's two or three that are believers, but a vast majority are atheists because they have felt so comfortable in their own studies with being able to explain everything, that we just don't need anything to um, account for life, the universe, and all this. (coughs) However, I will point out that I try to read some of that stuff, and I do recall when they um, were absolutely sure that it was in the probability of odds that life could exist in this universe of ours. But as they went on, they found out that it wasn't within the probability, that the odds were way too high for life to randomly appear in our universe. Statistically, it was impossible. Suddenly, there were a million universes which made it statistically possible to have life in ours. And I found that like, wow, what a coincidence that we needed a million billion universes in order to have the statistics to allow life to exist in our universe. I'm not accusing them of making crap up, but... um, (laughs) That was quite a shocker to me that it occurred roughly the same time. It gives me um, a lot of comfort that there seems to be part in human beings, there just seems to be a part in there that is drawn to the idea of having your own creator, that somehow there's something inside of you that is um, connected in some way. And I know that um, I have my people I sponsor read C.S. Lewis, the first 32 pages um, in Mere Christianity, where he goes through the moral law that seems to exist inside of you all of us, that uh, just is there. Nobody taught it to you. You're just just there. And this moral law 
sort of pushes on us to behave in a certain way. And when we don't behave that way, we feel guilty. And we also expect other people to be, live up to that same law. And if you travel around all the different countries, it's the same damn law. That there's, this is how one should live. And um, when he gets through explaining what's going on inside of you, it's as if he has access to our own brain and you, he just nails you when, when, when he finishes that. That um, this might be how a creator would set the stage to communicate with us by having this force this moral law inside of us that we can't live up to, causing a great deal of frustration, <clears throat> and eventually dawning on us that perhaps we're going to have to ask for help. <clears throat> and of course, in our book, it said many of us had moral philosophies galore, but we couldn't live up to them. That's the same thing that C.S. Lewis is talking about. But we couldn't live up to them. We just were falling short, no matter how hard we applied ourselves, leading us to eventually saying, I'm not, I can't do this, and I need help. And, of course, that's the doorway into spirituality, is that I need help. So anyway, this is all going on uh, at the same time. It's um, amazing. And I look at AA, the AA that I recall when I came in, and at the time I saw it as a jewel in the rest of society because it was going to supply a steady amount of miracles that would constantly reprove the existence of God. It's, and, and I just said, maybe that was one of the roles that AA was supposed to have, is to move us through this period of such change and supply um, a steady place where God could be proven. In other words, once somebody's transformed, you don't need to conduct any more experiments. And I'm sure that the most atheist scientists like Dawkins if his sister-in-law is a raging alcoholic and been bothering him for 35 years, suddenly gets transformed, he's going to have a hell of a time explaining it to himself. <laughs> now, he won't admit it, but I think he would have a hell of a time explaining it to himself. And he might just have to look over and go, well, maybe there's the one or two exceptions to the knowledge that I have. Much as um, William James did, where he saw these, throughout history, these desperate people who were able to surrender and be transformed beyond where they ever could have gotten on their own. And those people left an indelible impression in, on his mind. Um, but as time has gone on, there's been, a, the, the, I guess in the last 20 years, my observation, these are just my own observations. We had a, a lot of changes in AA. Initially, it was, um, it looked like, boy, this is really great when Senator Hughes a recovered alcoholic and a U.S. senator was able to spearhead 
alcoholism is a disease, get more acceptance, the stigma's going down. And then they pass another law to classify it as an illness that could be covered by insurance, like all other illnesses. And there was initially a great feeling like, this is great. We're really on the right track. And uh, boy, out of the woodwork, almost like, whew, came 12,000 treatment centers. Because suddenly it was possible to make a profit off of the disease of alcoholism, and it didn't take a businessman too long to realize there's a lot of freaking drunks in this country. Let's get in the business. And uh, so for the first time, AA groups were suddenly confronted with a bus arriving at their meeting, where up to that point, if a newcomer came, he generally came with his new sponsor, who introduced this person around the room, and uh, it kept the energy in the AA group the same. But when a bus, when the door opens and 20 people walk in, most of them young, and just sit down with each other and, you know, who are you? What are you doing here? It creates a uh, imbalance, at least it did until we got used to it, and we started talking to treatment centers and asking them to drop off three at this meeting, three at that meeting, three at that meeting, so that we could keep sort of the same energy that the meetings had. And I'm sure those of you who've been around a while, you may remember that, that it, that it came in. And um, also, we weren't uh, getting our hands on the newcomer till they had 30 days. I mean, if you wanted to go over to the treatment center, you could, but a lot of cases, they came to AA and looking for a sponsor with 30 days sobriety and a great deal of knowledge. <laughs> that had to be undone <laughs> by the sponsor. And um, boy, that took a while to get uh, comfortable with this. And, the, um, and then, of course, as business started dropping, then we have to have the treatment center take care of multiple addictions, including credit card addiction, They've ground up a credit card, especially Visa, and it chemically has the same effect as opium, uh, which proves that all addictions are the same. And that AA ought to accept Visa addicts as well as alcoholics. <laughs> which put a, a little test to primary purpose. Um, and so you can see that these were forces that we hadn't really had to deal with in this magnitude, especially the 30 days. That's, that's the, that is really hard to f because... During your first month of sobriety, you are sticking this stuff in it, you know, it's in your head, and then you're coming over, and they're going, no, don't, the treatment center's wrong on that, they're wrong on this, they're wrong on that. And it's very confusing. You know, here I come here, and the next person says we're wrong, I'll probably move to another city, and they're going to say my sponsor was wrong. I mean, it, it just, it made it a little harder for an orderly progression through our 12 steps. Um, then as the country, it started, I mean, I remember Madeline Murray, and she didn't want her son to listen to prayer in the schools. And um, then she won. And we went, holy cow. Because we said prayers in school all the time when I was little. And we all wondered, what's going on? 
why is this lady able to change all these things? Little did we know where it was going to go. And um, pretty soon there was quite a force for removing God from the consciousness of the uh, public. I'm not saying that it's totally done, but it is there. That's the society that started in the 50s and uh, is continuing so that you aren't as comfortable even saying the word God. You look around and go, I think it looks safe here, this bridge club, or whatever it is. I'm, 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 I'm looking at all the people, and then I go... Um, well, by the grace of God, I just won that hand. And your opponent goes, I wish you wouldn't bring that up during the bridge game. I mean, that never existed. So you can see these are forces in our society. And in that society, people who grew up in the society starting in the 70s and 80s, some of them are alcoholics and they're going to come to AA. And they're going to bring to us a lot of the ideas that they were given that I wasn't given when I came to AA. And they're going to want to know why we can't get rid of this in AA. And I think this ought to be gone and I think this ought to be gone. And there was much more um, attention paid to somebody who was new. I mean, I don't remember, correct me if I'm wrong, you old-timers, but I don't remember being able to say to an AA group when I had six months, you know, there's a bunch of crap you guys do at these meetings that I would like to see stopped. The response was going to be, you know, overwhelming. Sit down and shut up. You don't know what you're talking about and anything like that. But there's um, a tendency to feel uncomfortable about shutting somebody down. Like you might get in trouble. You might have, especially if they use the word offend. And boy, if I had known that word when I came in, I, it was, there was a lot of stuff that offended me. I didn't like the Lord's Prayer. I didn't like um, saying the word God. I didn't like the idea of doing the fourth step. I thought other people should make amends to me first. And had I known that if I just attached, this all offends me, that they might have um, changed it for me. And had they done that, I would be dead. Because when we come here, we're very self-centered and willful. And the way we save a self-centered alcoholic's life is by no longer allowing them to be willful and causing them to be willing. And so when I was told to get used to the Lord's Prayer, that someday I would love it, I was being done a big favor. I continued to hum during the Lord's Prayer. No, 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 no. I'm not saying this damn thing. I'm not going to say it. And after a couple of years, I sort of looked at all the people saying it with me, and I started feeling that connection. And pretty soon, it was such a vital element of Alcoholics Anonymous that I realized they were right when they told me, someday you're going to come to love this. And um, in 1980, in New Orleans, at the International Convention, holding hands, saying that prayer, uh, it was... Um, you know, for people all over the world, it was this most unifying thing that if I had been given the choice, I would have missed. 
So I was pushed into being willing. If we're not pushed, we don't get the spiritual lesson. And it allows our willfulness and self-centeredness to continue. So in a, in a very literal way, we're not doing anybody a favor when we capitulate and say, okay, well, we'll get rid of this, we'll get rid of that. I, um, there's a friend of mine from Brandon who's a member of an Al-Anon group over there. And when the church first um, accepted them in, the only room they had was a little dark room with no windows and all of this. And after about four years, they came and said, another group is leaving, and if you want, you can have their room which was much bigger, had windows, and it, the group was just so excited. But one member of the group didn't like all the crosses on the wall, so they went back to the dark room. They went back to the dark room. Now, it's almost like that story shouldn't exist, but it does. So there is a difference uh, that goes on at a very small scale that, um, to me, and this was just my own perspective, was changing the fundamental nature of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I overreacted <laughs> and became quite active in putting out these brush fires. I've spent two months writing a long paper on the subject of preserving God and AA. Center stage. Get these atheist groups out of here. They shouldn't be allowed. Look, I can show you the traditions. Bill didn't want a Catholic group, a Republican group, because um, it would start controversy within the group, and so that should include atheist groups and all these other things. And I really felt like I was on the right path. It really felt like this was the exception where you could criticize it <laughs> because it was such a high-level thing. Not like other people who criticize over petty crap. <laughs> I was... I was bound to determine to go after this thing that if we didn't go after it, it might actually destroy AA. So this is where my, um, I'll just tell you, that paper, I, I wrote it in um, probably a month, but it took me two months to take the anger out of it. You know what I mean? Most, most of the anger, yeah. <laughs> I had a critic along to help me. <laughs> Someone told me that, um, geez, that there was a group in New York that had changed the steps, they had taken God out, and I'm going, that can't be true. So I went online, typed in New York in a group meetings, there it was. All these um, atheist groups had uh, changed the steps and taken God out. And it said there that they were, um, they all had general service representatives. They belonged to AA. They sent money in. So um, as an observer, I'm assuming that this must have received somebody's approval. And uh, I kind of went, how the hell did we get a policy like this without me ever hearing about it. How could that have happened? That they had a vote somewhere? Or, and the, there was never a vote. It just happened. It just happened that this was okay. I did a little more research and found uh, that Chicago had their own little deal going. Quad A. And um, one of my friends from Akron went to the uh, inner group and 
just casually asked the intergroup manager, what's this quad A? And the response was, oh, we love them. They give so much more money than the Christian groups. It's an unusual response. (laughs) So it fed my little, boy, I better redouble my efforts. This is a... This is going on faster than I realized. And then, um, geez, I, there was one group in uh, Berkeley, and it was something like the Devil's Heathen group of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I felt that was a little over the edge <laughs> in terms of choosing a name. Um, And then Toronto came along, which, um, you know, boy, now we got it in the newspapers and anonymity breaks and, um, and the intergroup is suddenly left with a, um, decision. Are you going to list this group in your meeting list if it changes the steps? So I've got to hold the, Request and I sent it off to our inner group. I said, you know, guys, you ought to pay attention to this. This just happened. What are you going to respond to when you get this letter, which is coming soon, trust me? They didn't answer my letter. They weren't excited about this at all. So I went over there and I said, geez, uh, did you get that letter I sent? Yeah, thanks, that was very interesting. <laughs> Well, when would you like me to brief the board on the terrible threat that is racing through AA? No, we're okay. Thanks. We're glad you got the letter. And so I just attribute it to ignorance. Our intergroup here in Florida obviously is out of touch with the stuff I'm following. <laughs> And there was a lot of people that I talked to that jumped on my side because they like controversy. Oh, yeah, well, uh, what can I do? Pretty soon I found another guy. He wrote a paper like that. mine. It was a better. It was 50 pages instead of 38. So, um, but every so often I'd run into a guy who would say, oh, God will take care of this. And I would go, no, there's a clear signal that God wants us to take care of this. (laughs) So I guess what I'm doing here is I'm doing a fourth and fifth step. (laughs) You're not getting an amend, I'm going to tell you that. He just sat there taking cheap shots at conventions <laughs> while well, I'm trying to protect us all. <laughs> and I didn't feel too grateful for that. I don't like him to be right. Now, our our literature (coughs) actually uses the word real alcoholic. And it differentiates a real alcoholic from what I would call situational alcoholics. Someone who looks like an alcoholic is drinking like an alcoholic, but there's a particular reason. Their wife of 50 years died. And so the man just started drinking, and if you observe him, he looks like a regular alcoholic, but it turns out after a certain amount of time, he doesn't have to drink anymore. And he's comforted and so on down. And there's others where somebody has an illness, but he recovers from it. And so there's that, those classifications are in our big book. And, <clears throat> With the, um, 
what I call dumping into AA, we started getting larger numbers of people with drinking problems who weren't real alcoholics. But they liked AA, so they would stay. I mean, they, they loved the company, they loved the, you know, we go, we go out and we do things. But they were constant reminders that it was possible to get sober and be happy without a spiritual awakening. Because we all assumed that they were real alcoholics. So we had another confusion factor being dumped in here. We would have people in our midst who were just saying, oh, I didn't need any of that. I, I, I just came here and stopped drinking. I'm happy, and, but I, I, don't, I didn't have to dig into all the step work and, and that. I, I like it, and I've made some amends, and I've done this, but it was clear that there was no urgency in their case like there is for the real alcoholic. So I'm just pointing out how confusing it can get. The next thing was our official publications. And I don't offer any explanation for this, but there was a lot of stuff in the grapevine and uh, in speeches by the chairman of our trustees that um, seemed to say that AA was scaring off a lot of potential customers with an overemphasis on God. Scaring off a lot of potential customers with an overemphasis on God. And of course, this fit right in to my little thing. I, now I had a conspiracy theory. <laughs> that this chain of circumstances, this crowd was jumping on it in order to um, make AA grow. Remember one time that we were worried about our growth figures and we weren't growing, and somewhere in the service manual, Bill said, we shouldn't be concerned about growth. It's none of our business. It's up to God. Uh, I found that very comforting. And so if you have a home group and it gets smaller and then gets bigger, nobody's doing anything wrong. This is just life. It's the way it's happening. And we've all seen it. When um, very popular people that uh, are the big force behind a dynamic group and they pass away and they try to keep the thing going in the same manner, it can fall flat because that particular personality isn't there anymore. And I know we talk about principles over personalities, but let me tell you, we've had some personalities that I am so glad they were ex existed in AA. A lot of them characters, but boy... Um, Clarence Snyder, I wish I had, I could have known him because he came down here to Tampa area, Orlando, and um, continued to be very, very active and ran men's retreats in this area. And the interesting thing was that the first half of the retreat was AA and the second half was Jesus. So if you didn't want to hear about Jesus, you have to leave at halftime. <laughs> and um, that's just who he was. But I, have, after reading about him, I, I just think he was the most amazing guy. I'll tell you one story. He was the, like the champion 12-stepper. He could go into bars and talk people into coming with him to go down to Akron. And he came across a guy under a bridge who had alcoholic paralysis which is a condition where your body is paralyzed, but you're conscious and you can hear. Perfect thing for a 12-step call. <laughs> the, guy, 
the guy can't leave, but he can hear everything you're saying. He has to stay there. <clears throat> and Clarence starts talking to him, you know. But look, you're under the bridge. <laughs> just... So he goes on and on, and finally he says, Now, if we can get you down there, would you agree to go down to Dr. Bob's in Akron? And he gets the yes or whatever. And he said, Now, it's $50. Can you get $50? And the guy says, no, but my mother would give $50 to save me. He says, well, where's your mother? And he says, well, she lives in this house out in the country. This is in Clarence's book. So he takes off. He had a car. He was a car salesman. And pretty soon the road wouldn't go any further, so he had to go on foot. And it was hunting season, and he's hearing rifles going off all around him. And finally, he comes up to this farmhouse, and he knocks on the door, and this elderly woman comes. He mentions the son's name, and her eyes light up, but she only speaks Polish. So he thinks it's a lost cause until... A young girl, like a granddaughter, comes up who's in an English school, and she translates for her mother. So-and-so is under a bridge and um, has an alcoholic, and this man can take him down to treatment. We just need $50. And she's so excited, she runs back and comes out with all kinds of money. He takes the money back and gets the guy to treatment. And he went on 12-step calls like that all the time where it, it, nothing would stop him. So I see personalities like that that are all over AA. And I'm sure in your area you have two or three people who fit this category and you're really glad that they were there. You really were glad. Um, so I'm, I'm just laying out my view of our society as I thought about it. And um, I saw what I thought was going to reduce the spiritual power of something that I f felt very dear about and that I didn't want to see it happen. And so I started talking with other people. There were various people around the country that were felt the same way. And they would feed in stories uh, that were going on. And that um, one place, a guy, they're not even sure he was in AA, but he just showed up in the town and went from group to group asking them to get rid of the Lord's Prayer because it offended him and he really wanted to stay in this town and get sober. And he was batting about 40% by just showing up at one meeting, giving it the tears. I do want to stay sober, but there's no way I could keep coming to the meeting if you do that. And then move on to another town. He just had a clear agenda of going around and getting rid of the Lord's Prayer. Um, And then, of course, the International in San Antonio when the, there was no prayer after the final event. And there was a lot of old-timers who came back from San Antonio who were quite sad. They really felt something was wrong that we're closing this great spiritual event with I am responsible. I mean, of all things, it's not even we are responsible, it's I. And it was just this, yet yeah, I'll take care of it. I mean, it was, it was just um, the, almost the opposite of a prayer. So I'm, a, I'm just giving you the stuff that I'm adding up in my little machine, assessing my view of uh, the problem that we have and what's going on in our society. Uh, in, in the meantime, there's many people who, when I would talk to them, never heard of any of it. 
And when I got through, they were all upset, and they wished I hadn't talked to them. <laughs> God damn, I wish he hadn't come around. I was pretty happy in AA. <laughs> Everything's fine in our town. I don't know what that was. Well, Jesus Christ, now i got to think about that. And he has all those years, so, uh-oh, I better listen. It doesn't matter how many years you have, you can make mistakes and feel that um, you're really on the right track. That if somebody has to do this, why not me? So I would be writing things and I would read everything, every grapevine article, every general service conference report, and I'd look in there and I'd go, see this sentence? There it is. They're selling us out again. This is a clear evidence. Kevin knows that he used to get me those things and then he'd wait two days for my phone call. Kevin, have you seen page 17? He said, yeah, I thought you'd find that. <laughs> um, it's kind of funny now, but it was very serious then. I did feel sorry for Toronto. God, that was a tough one. So, at some point, I started realizing that um, I wasn't changing anything. That Every effort I put into this thing was accomplishing zero. And that there were certain people who didn't want to see me show up. They go, oh, Jesus. Um, a lot of the New York office staff got tired of my phone calls. Um, so I said to myself, you're very disturbed about this. And I went, yeah, I am. Well, you know, 12 and 12, if something disturbs you, no matter what the cause, there's something wrong with you. It doesn't apply here. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is a much bigger issue than the, the freaking 12 and 12 is talking about. <laughs> this is... This is the survival of alcoholics for the next hundred years we're talking about. This isn't some little... Yeah, but you're still disturbed. Yeah, I, I, I understand that, but being disturbed is where you get the energy to do the work. I mean, that's how it works. And then I went, no, you've advocated that Um, axiom your whole sobriety I can find where I was talking about that and I had about five years that's how powerful that axiom is something disturbs you there's something wrong with you so I said to myself well what the hell's wrong with me and so I had to give the same answer I give to the people I sponsor. You're disturbed. That's what's wrong with you. You have to get undisturbed in order to proceed. And we jump ahead a paragraph or two, and there's the four steps to getting undisturbed. One is self-restraint. Well, I didn't have much of that. I was, I was reacting... So I'm going to need some self-restraint so that I can hear about Toronto, not react until I'm undisturbed about it. Then I needed to get an honest analysis of what was going on, and the only way to do that is to ask someone else to help you think this through. And when I got through that, there was just two things left. Either it's my fault, I'm wrong, and I have to make an amend, or they're wrong, and I have to forgive them. I have to forgive 
all these people that are trying to screw up AA. Wow. And that let me get a little calmer so that I could think about this some more. And um, it came... to where I thought about, well, what could be done to, that would be the most effective force in preserving the fellowship the way I found it? If it's not complaining and writing papers and putting up defenses and all that, what is it? And um, I started thinking about William James and how this isolated few people transformed the way he thought about religion and God. That they, their transformation became enough evidence And that if you're in a room and you have real alcoholic newcomers and non-alcoholic newcomers, what are you going to do? Tell the non-alcoholics they can't come? They don't know any different. How How are you going to differentiate here? What could be done? And somewhere, I saw the final paragraph in our book. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. So could that be the answer? Get my relationship with my higher power on a stronger level than it is now. And great events will come to pass. And something led me to the um, prayer of St. Francis. I said, all these wrong things are happening. What am I supposed to do about it? Everybody knows the prayer. That where it's wrong, we bring a spirit of forgiveness. Back to the damn forgiveness again. (laughs) Keep showing up. They're just doing what they're motivated to do. And um, it's none of my business, and I should forgive them. Um, so I decided that the greatest force to ensure the longevity of AA was something that I like to call a beacon. And you know there are people in AA that you would refer to as a beacon. They just transmit an energy that is unmistakable. And if a real alcoholic encounters this energy, they will recognize it immediately as the answer to what they're seeking. There will be that connection immediately. And a non-alcoholic may see the energy and not be interested in it because they don't need it. And so it's the energy itself solves the problem of the non the heavy drinker and the real alcoholic. And so the question is how do you ensure a steady supply of beacons? 
I think something like this has contributed to that. Because it requires a decision on an individual's part to become a seeker and to transform, make a decision in your mind that you're going to move in this direction, that your role is to develop spiritually as far as you can. I remember telling Steve, my goal is to see how close I can come to awakening, whatever the hell that is. It just seemed cool. It seemed like, well, why not? You know, why, why not do that instead of dropping your golf handicap one stroke? Which would be a bigger accomplishment. And it, it became appealing. Um, so I hope today that some of you that are here will take heed of that that this is a very confusing society right now, very confused. And it needs some kind of steady influence to make sure it stays on course. And if you're lost, there's nothing like a beacon to make you feel comfortable again. Whether you're in an airplane or on a boat or Walking across the land, once you get a fix, it offers great comfort. And this is a fix that is selective in that its energy goes to the person who really needs it. And prior to that, we're not sure which, what we got here. We got 10 people that suddenly arrived and all this. And they will be attracted. And here we are, all the way back to the fundamentals. It's a program of attraction. I had a lot of fun out there raising hell. (laughs) And secretly, I'm glad I did it. But I'm going to let somebody else have the fun of doing that. And I'm just going to focus on producing beacons. Um, And I hope there's some in this room. And I hope you go back and spot people that you're sponsoring and you might see it in them. And if we have these strategically placed, it's going to ensure that we're anchored to our past that we talked about yesterday. It'll it'll just ensure that. Because, boy, they sure had some back then, didn't they? We had some real beacons. And we still can feel their energy and... um, and their talks. So my hope is that um, I can put the fun stuff away and come up with um, ideas or methods of increasing the energy in beacons. That's a rather interesting job, isn't it? Beacon energy increaser. That's my job description. I think it's, um, it feels right. And it feels comfortable. And it feels that there's no conflict. When the energy meets the right person, magic happens. We have someone who, as Carl Jung was talking about, is missing 
The, the only thing that's missing in their lives is this conscious contact. They don't realize it, but they know that something's missing. And they walk in the room, and they feel their home. Just because of the energy. And it transpires, probably looks something like this. If um, lauder is the energy source, at the end of the meeting, some young man comes up and says, could I talk to you a minute? That's it. Could I talk to you a minute? What did you mean when you said this? Could you help me for that? I mean, it, it is that simple. And that's all that the basics of AEA has been about since day one. Is one alcoholic, not a heavy drinker, one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic. And if that other alcoholic has already been influenced positively by the energy or what was said, the odds are this is going to be a tremendous success and that we'll just continue being one of the greatest societies that I think has ever been around. And so I just was um, imagining, and if you'll help me imagine, what the um, what it would feel like to this new person who eagerly goes up to someone and says, can I talk to you? And when they finish talking, things look different. You remember when they started looking different to you? And so we've always closed in the same way. If everybody would just close your eyes and imagine that you're being in the middle of this energy and you finish and you look around at the same world that you have been in for quite a while and this is what you see. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.